Though we've only been able to observe the land for a little over five seasons, within that time frame, we've gone through quite a bit of weather extremes, from a relatively severe drought to heavy snows, a long winter, and pelting rains, which caused severe flooding in the surrounding areas. We can only surmise that these weather extremes will be an example of what's to come, and we should look to prepare the land and reestablish ecosystem function to handle these fluctuations. The drought in the late fall of 2020 didn't give us an opportunity to see how water truly moves through and on the land. It did, however, give us quite a bit of security to know that, though the rivulets that run through the forest came to a slow trickle, the four ponds on the land, one which is primarily fed by an underground spring, held up extremely well to the drought conditions, which indicates a level of resiliency in the landscape. It was only in the fall of 2021 when we could really witness the power of water. The heavy rains also happened to coincide during a time when we had removed some of the sod in the upper lawn area, extracted old nursery materials from the newly graded meadow area, and dug a 1,000-foot trench to lay an underground internet cable, which ultimately became Saunders' very own Dutch canal. Or at least, that's what we told ourselves to keep the mood light. Overall, the copious amounts of water zigzagged through the landscape, either being filtered through the rivulets that run through the forest or working their way down through a series of ponds. As we zoomed out, we could see that this landscape was really designed to capture, collect, and cycle water. But given the heavier rains and our changes to the landscape, some problem areas emerged, including sodden paths along the north side of the lawn, and most importantly, unintended wet areas that aggressively washed away a rudimentary access path and settled in and around the north side of our barn. We had some ideas on how we could manage this, but wanted to bring in our friend Sean from Edible Acres to weigh in on how he would approach water management on the land. Now, Sean is intensely observant when it comes to noticing signs and cues in the landscape and often opts for a more light-handed approach modifying and adjusting as one goes. We felt he would be the perfect person to weigh in before we took it upon ourselves to fix the driveway and other areas, only to realize that it'll lead to the same problems down the line. So this actually used to be a, a well, it is still a spring that fed this and had a little rivulet that went down through this way. And so they ended up digging this massive two and a half acre pond the inflow is there on the northwest then. It is. Okay, but then also probably from underneath and then also probably from various whatnots. And also down the slope. Yeah. Like I think, you know, this is obviously a big slope and if you were to put a pond, that would be probably, yeah. I guess the perfect place to put it. It also has a six inch diameter pipe that constantly flows water from the bottom out. Plus there's an overflow at the top. The largest pond, which we call Half Lake, covers 2.5 acres and accommodates a drainage area of over 20 acres. It holds approximately 3.3 million gallons of water, reaching 11 feet at its greatest depth, and is home to grass carp, smallmouth and largemouth bass, and various aquatic insects and amphibians, including frogs and salamanders. The overflow area on the southern side of Half Lake is a relatively acidic, boggy area, which we would look to reclaim from the exotic honeysuckle and multiflora rose that have choked out potential habitat for other native species. I felt there was a little bit of a spring. I, somewhere we were walking, I could feel the ground was thawed out and leech your weeping, mm -hmm. which makes sense. You've got like this gentle bowl in this direction mm -hmm. too. Um, I mean, another thing about the soil here is that most of it came from the bottom of this pond. So hmm. it's like really clayey. Oh yeah, I saw that in the picture. They have yeah. like a strata of super deep 
way, should have been 12 feet down in the earth clay yeah. with some topsoil on top. Yeah. Okay, so that's fun. So, and the, but also our native soils here, if we look at it, like Volusia, Channery, Silt Loam, it tends to be, a, um, has a hard compaction layer, mm -hmm. you know, not super well draining, hold, doesn't perk well, that kind of thing. So perfect for ponds. Yeah. But, you know, so the reason why we're coming over here is because there's a six inch pipe, as Sandra was saying, and there's an overflow. So when it hit, hits over the overflow and it's not frozen over, it actually kicks the water back into this area, which we're looking to reclaim anyway because it's uh, filled with honeysuckle and multiflora rose and we'd like to actually open it up and it's a neat kind of like a little boggy area back here uh -huh. and then this then has an overflow down to this little rivulet which is still on our land that that's part of our land it just happens to have this deer fence here and um, it goes down that way which hasn't had any real problem for us on this side it's just how it um how it flows here. So what, there's a stand pipe? That's yeah. the overflow right there? Yeah. And how do you keep that clear? We haven't had to keep it clear, I guess. It looks a little gunky right now. Huh. It's still running. It's still running, yep. Yeah. But that's the one way that this whole pond is meant to Drain, or drain like on this side. To keep the freeboard, to keep the the retaining dike with a good like yeah. two feet of play. Yeah. Have you seen this level come up at all? I actually know that it's been up to the base of this tree. Okay. Like just to the foot of it. So is there a spillway or an emergency overflow? The spillway is on that side. So in that little dip that we just walked past. If it if it happens, if this clogs and there's an emergency and it's em gonna go out. It there. goes out over there. And have you have you seen water like last fall after no. some rains? Okay. And um, it's been really dry here when we the, first came here, and then it's been really wet. Twenty. And this pond's yeah. been really stable. Yep. Um, the highest I've ever seen again was up to the base of this tree. Yeah. And yeah, the lowest. I don't have a mark for that. But I want to install one of those sticks so you mm -hmm. can measure the, the height. Yeah, that makes water. sense. Yeah, I mean, that's something to keep an eye on. There's a fragility in that. It's that same picture of like, if water is managed through tubes, then if something ever clogs that, then that changes the dynamics of this really fast. Yeah. And it, you know, maybe you have a tool that hangs out out here that's like an aluminum stick with a hook that you can reach out. You leave it next to the, the pine and you can reach out and pull that material off especially as we come into these thaws, like tonight and tomorrow, maybe we get six to eight inches of yeah. snow and then it thaws really fast next week. Like we see 60 degrees for a few days. Mm -hmm. So stuff's gonna move really quickly and having that open, uh, just have an eye on that. seems like there's some value in that. Yeah, that's good advice because uh, we really wanna have like more resiliency in this whole thing and then this whole system, it's a great water catchment tool um, there are fish that live in here too, mm -hmm. uh, but you know we saw it when it was really droughty, and it was quite lo a lot lower. And then we saw it last this last fall when it was really high, to the point that we we didn't even hear this moving through. Right, Sonder? It was above yeah. the um, the drainage. Yeah, it's a pretty massive. I think you said it's three and a half million gallons of water. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. Roughly. That's a lot of water. It's I mean, a there's, lot of water. We don't need to get into it now, but like that pipe, when the water's flowing through, the amount of pressure and head as it, wherever it exits there, uh -huh. has some opportunity to think about like a micro hydro power backup system. Oh yeah, like, that's a great idea. I just wonder like how much power will it really be able to generate? There's ways to calculate all that. It wouldn't be like, it'll run your house, but right. you could, it's far enough from your house that it wouldn't be something to like wire over to there. But it like, would be cool if no, we did if the floating something here. The floating house that we well, had. Well, we think of putting some kind of floating house here, but it's, yeah, it's away from any electric, away from any water, so we'll have to figure out those things on its own. Yeah, yeah like thinking about one or two solar panels because you've got good sun, mm -hmm. but then some sort of uh, micro hydro 
at the outlet yeah. that's a short enough run that it could be charging small battery arrays. Mm -hmm. I don't have direct experience. I've been researching it a lot. I haven't, mm -hmm. I haven't actually explored it, but that sort of focused, continual water going through an aperture that's focused before it leaves is like perfect for that application. Yeah. So something to think about. Right, so this is the emergency overflow, yeah. but you've never seen water flowing mm, no. over this. And boy, that's, yeah, that's like a really nicely shielded sill. Like it would come up here and then it would have to come out over all this vegetated yeah. and back. And back, and then there's a stream that goes back there. Right, so it's got- takes it, it down to the culvert or yeah. to that pond down and there. This is also part of the Right here, this slope. Yep. Which I want, boy, they're really regimented tree scenes. Oh, I know. It's the one thing that we really don't <laughs> it's love. Like that kind of thing. I know. Well, but it's there. That's and cool. And it's deer browsed on the yeah. bottom. Um, okay, so then there's naturally, so what, there was drainage tile in here that you pulled out? Uh, there, there's some that we left in, but yeah, there's a lot of drainage tile that we pulled out. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. You're below below the water grade there. Like water's clearly, it's not like the dam is leaking, but there would just be aquifer recharge. There'd be pressure of water underneath that would work its way up, you know, slowly, steadily. There might be some value in exploring. I don't know if you have interest in this layer, but like where the overflow is happening, mm -hmm. not what, where the overflow in an emergency mm -hmm. potential is set to think about adding in more shrub layer or, you know, like, is there more complexity that can be added to that beyond just an herbaceous, like what it looks maybe brush hogged once a year, grasses? Yeah, we haven't really done much to that area. It turns into a real cattail marsh, that's mm -hmm. for sure. That part, yeah. that's great. Maybe, I mean, you could, because it's so such a gentle grade into the water, mm -hmm. you could think about more like aquatic perennial nursery, you know, calamus and yeah. arrowhead and water lotus and that kind of thing if you wanted to have additional characters entering into the water. But then as a, you come up to grade and up to drier soil, but it's still wet. And once in a blue moon, it might be a place that receives huge amounts of water flow shielding it further with the roots of, for example, like elderberries and mm -hmm. willows and mm -hmm. or alder or currants or honeyberries or, you know, there's a bunch of different shrub layers that have very fibrous root systems and they can really handle wetness mm -hmm. that if it were to ever overflow, you'd ha just have more characters. I, ca I, I don't know, it's I call it like the baleen whale, like that, you know, that there's like all these teeth that can, if there's lifted material, hurricanes, yeah. and there's dead uh, cattails and debris that's flowing out that can get caught by those, that just holds more nutrient, holds more soil. Yeah. There's less chance for erosion with that. Yeah, I, I agree. We ended up doing some more, I mean, we haven't really concentrated yet on the, um, on the planting of the ponds. We feel like that's gonna be probably a 2023 project. But um, we did do like some uh, native irises and I got like one of those like uh, like hibiscus plants that grow in the water. I don't, it's a little, it's on, I don't know if it'll come back cause it's like borderline six, seven mm. and we're kind of like five, six here. Right. So, yeah. so I don't know if it'll come back. And, um, and we noticed last year and maybe it was because of the rain or this past you know, fall, the cattails seemed a lot larger mm -hmm. <laughs> and more in charge. Um, but we started to do meadow sweet, lobelia. And then this area is actually part of the seepage of the septic as well. So this actual area gets wet. You could see where the green is. Mm -hmm. So this is an overflow already. So I think bringing that, some of those uh, plant mixes that you'd mentioned would be sensible here. And before we had to grade this land, it was almost all physocarpus. I don't know that plant. Nine bark. Oh, okay. I mean, hundreds of physocarpus, huh. which is native, 
Yeah. And I think it thrives in that kind of marshy, wet area. Really beautiful flowers. You see the, that one that's going like this, that has this kind of structure that in the distance? Yeah, yeah. That's a physocarpus. Huh, I should look at them closely. Maybe I know of them as different names. These are all nine bark too. You'll see the dead flowers. I'll pull, I'll pull one up for you so that you might. Okay, yeah, I've definitely seen these before, but I haven't worked with them. I haven't interacted with them that much. Uh, just like an ornamental. It's it. They have made them into ornamentals, like. But we have our native ones are just green leaves with pretty white flowers, cool. and they're really great pollinator plant. And yeah. I think because of the nursery escapees, I think we have a combination of native and like cultivated just escaped the whole thing but mm -hmm. it's beautiful and they thrive and i think like we're gonna i i hated taking them out when we had them but i think some of them we left and i think their root structure is still underneath but yeah this area we wouldn't mind i don't care that this is wet yeah if we go back up here before we go to here i'll show you some of the areas that we do mind a little more. So what, as you were doing earthwork, you worked around existing trees that you found in here? Well, not exactly, because some existing trees were quaking aspens and stuff like that, and we ended up removing them just so we could get a grade, because mm -hmm. we realized that there was just too much garbage underneath the ground. We took out 32 tons of trash. Like literal plastic, yeah. Plastic, geotextile Metal, yeah. materials, like Yeah, another... That, Another good reminder to av avoid designing systems that depend on that. Right. It's like you only get the benefit, quote unquote, of it for a little while, and then someone down the line has to deal has with. Has to deal with it, yeah. You know, it or the earth its has to. Purpose, I guess, as a as a nursery, but a, a, right. you know, a, a different kind of nursery. Yeah. So, uh, because I think this is more gently sloping. We end up getting a lot of uh, water here, stuck here and here. And um, I planted quite a bit, like 30 different native sedges as an alternative to grass over here. Okay, cool. Uh, you'll see some sticking up because some of it was plugs and some of it was uh, yeah. seed, but this is this is an ice slick and this we, we didn't even do any bulb planting here because it gets too wet so we're curious as to like if there's a way that we could design this so that the water just doesn't stay here like that uh but you know kind of could seep in or s travel somewhere else i don't know when it comes to figuring out solutions to questions like this the first thing i always try to explore is is it is it actually necessary yeah. and i'm not saying that in a confrontational way it's more like just to really ask that question like it it can be an eyesore and it can be frustrating or you know a little bit challenging to navigate through here in the winter if there's ice but other than those like aesthetics or access seasonal access questions are there other pressures that you're feeling well certainly okay you're saying bulbs feel like they'd have a hard time here but yeah. we could maybe identify really wet tolerant semi-shade appreciating plants so are yeah. there other reasons that are coming up beyond those those are all valid yeah i'm not invalid but i'm just making sure like we can explore because yeah. the easiest thing to do is be like let's shift our own sensibility on it and it's done yeah but yeah, I, I, I don't mind it being actually a little wet here. That's why I went and planted sedges. And, yeah. and I think like for me personally, sedges are something that people don't plant. And so many of our host uh, in, insects need them for as host plants. Hmm. So I kind of was like, oh, this gives me a really good opportunity to like try all different sedges that are shorter sedges that look like grass and can appear like grass. Um, and then nine bark we planted again because we know that it does well in the landscape. I guess the question is too yeah. with this area is this is one of the main paths coming in. Is there something that we can plant here that will use all this water or do we have to drain it out somehow by either digging a trench or doing some of the, that plastic pipe again? Okay, so yeah. this is from like a human access flow pattern, this is a really used thoroughfare. Yeah, this is cool. like a okay. walking, 
like, because people use, and it does tear up the ground a little bit here because of its wetness. Yeah. It's not ideal, it's not ideal when you walk, like we stop walking through here when it's wet because it does tear up the area pretty badly. Yeah, it's definitely soupy. Yeah. So, yeah, so then if, if the question of do we need to do anything or not lands at yes, we do, then the next step is uh, before, so clearly some sort of modification is in order, the scale of which it remains TBD, right? But like, what is the water that's coming into this scene? And so the first place that I would be thinking is clearly the driveway. So nearish where I parked, it's aiming now, that's a split watershed. Like it's kind of at the bay of the garage door there, it feels like the crest of the hill in mm -hmm. that little area. Yeah. And so to the east, to the east and north, is that, am I reading that right? Eastish? Um, this is south. This is south. Okay. Yeah. So north, okay. Um, the water that's moving through this way, clearly on this side of the driveway is coming, it's aggregating into here. So like if you're getting, if you're thinking about the driveway being reinforced and redone, that's the first place is like, what does it look like to, is there a way to cut something that asks the water to move along a little bit further? Right. I mean, you want to be careful that you're not channelizing it so much that, that it's like... It becomes a stream, yeah. And cuts Which is out. what we accidentally did when we were running the internet cable. It rained pretty quickly after a thousand foot internet cable dig that Sonder did and then it became a Dutch canal. Uh -huh. So yeah, and, and we actually have a trench that was dug on the other side, but not here, uh -huh. which we understand. Um, but we thought even maybe just berming up the driveway a bit more could assist, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, that's challenging too, because then yeah. it's like, okay, you've got to plow this periodically. Right. And so either is the soil impounding, because you really do need the water, the water in the snow needs to be able to leave the surface of the driveway. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's less exciting, like we're less in the permaculture, like planting realm and more like, you know, DIY civil engineer, you know, yeah. like <laughs> grading our driveway yeah. and crush number two yeah. stuff. But there is something to that of, of like, okay, the driveway needs to allow the water off of it yeah. and start, start figuring out how the water can begin moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. But as soon as is reasonable, and so it's like right around where that well pipe stands, mm -hmm. it feels as though the water that's running parallel to the driveway can then be asked to make a turn and go back into the field mm -hmm. rather than like, keep going, keep going, right. go, go, go. Yeah. It's like, as soon as you're out of this particular minor bowl, and we can ask it back in, let's invite it back in again. And it can be wet down there and dealt with, right. with either swales or micro pond or whatever. Um, and that could be something that's as simple as shovel work, which is kind of like my default place to begin. Is like, we get a bunch of snow tonight, tomorrow, next week, lots of thaw happens mm -hmm. and water is going to be liberated and moving mm -hmm. is to come out. You can sharpen the tips of shovels and the two of you or a crew of people yeah. can just be shaving. It doesn't have to be these like two foot deep, you know, chunks ripped yeah. out. It could just be like cutting the sod and maybe cutting it and putting it on this side uh -huh. to say as water's coming into this drainage that it's got a speed bump yeah. before it can come over to here. Right. Um, but I, that, I actually don't mind if we had more fibrous root plants here. Like, you know, the thing is what we're trying to work with is we're working with some of his previous trees that he planted, which are yeah. nice specimens. They're so cool, yeah. it's kind of like trying to navigate it where it doesn't become so bushy that it hides like what he had planted um yep. but but that like that's why i was like sedges and things like that and that's why i was like thinking well as we start to plant that uh, we had to take up this area too so um it, it was dealing with less vegetation so mm -hmm. we think that maybe we could play out this year and see how it does when the vegetation starts coming back you know in yeah, and a really passive way. So there's the co so it's how do we ask upland, you know, watershed mm -hmm. stuff that's aggregating and focusing the air to move along, mm -hmm. but not like get out of here. Yeah. But like here you go, Slowly. come on back down here. 
that's one, that's, that's a very uh, high leverage, right? Like an hour or two of shovel work might change thousands of gallons of water wanting to sit here. Right. The next, you know, high leverage for low input is what does it look like to get a big load of fresh wood chips dumped somewhere around here and it's an opportunity to really focus foot traffic as well and say mm. where we want to have actual foot traffic, not like a diffused 20 foot wide or 16 mm -hmm. foot wide potential walking space, but like a three foot wide band that's mm -hmm. good for foot traffic, maybe a wheelbarrow, that mm -hmm. kind of, like if you need a garden cart, you can design for that. Mm -hmm. But ideally it's like a minor access mm -hmm. and that you dump some like six to eight inch thick deposits of wood chips that's really nicely compacted and goes to the sides, then the rest of it can be wetter longer and foot traffic isn't gonna bite into the soil. Um, it isn't gonna like ruin the vegetation. It helps really hone compaction, which mm -hmm. you'd wanna do anyway. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's lots of access for people to move through here. So if you needed like a bigger thing or a truck to buy, like there's yeah. other options yeah. that you could really define. And then once you're out of that particular wet spot, the wood chips can kind of fade out and you go right. back to grade. Right. Um, that's like one truckload of wood chips and about an hour or two. And that avoids then saying, okay, we need to really dig down. Cause right now it's like you're in a bowl there mm -hmm. and we've got both the roots of these trees, which are, you know, probably shallow, probably mm -hmm. out into the walkway. I'm you guessing, have yeah. question marks around electricity around that box. Yeah, which and, had trees actually around it, but we removed them cause they were completely deer browsed. Yeah, so then getting into digging in that area, mm -hmm. you can do it, but because there's a bowl, it's a much heavier lift. You would need to either, you know, cut down six inches, eight inches almost, to start sending it truly southbound pa between the trees and the electric. And then you're right. getting into the roots of them and all that. Yeah. So it's like, can we ask the water first to move along? Here, yeah. Yep. Identify what the, what the impediment is, which it clearly is like access and flow and compaction slash degradation of the vegetative layer mm -hmm. and address that through bringing up a new road base, mm -hmm. but it's organic. So then it breaks down and it feeds the sedges, it feeds whoever's nearby. Mm -hmm. Then you can add in more plants later and then see if that addresses it. And I'm guessing between those two, it would get it like good enough that yeah. you can say like, cool, what's the next thing? You yeah, know? exactly. Um, I don't know if that helps or that, if that is that is really helpful and I think that this was an area that we felt like we could start doing some directing and I think that you're right in saying that you know once it kind of gets into this meadow area we don't worry about the water we'll show you where we start worrying about it again uh -huh. we'll just plant to what it what it is one other question the downspout on this side of the house that goes down to the earth do you know where that goes from there do you I haven't I really. I think that's where it terminates. Oh. It just goes right there. Or it must tie into the other side of the house. Like a friend, ultimately, probably goes down in French strain and goes towards the pond. Because there is, the, on the other side, yeah. it does go towards the pond. Okay. There is a, there is a French drain kind of set up. Because that's, that's a question. If in the outside chance they routed, because again, you know, downspout goes to the earth. Mm -hmm. and disappears, we have no idea what's happening. Is it right. impounded? Are there roots? Does it just, is it sitting at the foundation of the house, like all of that water mm -hmm. just sitting there that then the sump pump has to deal with? But having an answer to that might be of value in the bigger question of why does there, why is there more water than is ideal in mm -hmm. an otherwise gently sloping, like clearly gentle bowl, but not mm -hmm. so much of a bowl that it would address like, holding water for so long. Right. There are other influencers happening um, that might be worth looking into. Uh, you might not yeah. want to have like a water tank there, but it's you- It's definitely worth it to like, we could route that um, downspout underneath that little deck section mm -hmm. to the other side of the house and then make it tie into the drain that goes to the pond. Yep, or it could be on the surface. I mean, that could be four inch, cor the corrugated black poly. Right. You know, you can hide it well enough. That's a $50 thing, really pretty reasonable. And now it's above ground. So then if it does ever clog, you can open it up and clear it mm -hmm. uh, and see what's going on. And it could dump into a French drain that's buried towards the pond, could also dump out on the downside of the house and explore the idea of like slightly wet, uh, 
um, swales on contour going down to the pot, like the other options open yeah. up. But have but knowing for sure that that water isn't simply just getting dumped in the yard there. Yeah. In the yard, yeah, either coming out this way and aggravating the problem, or just simply sitting next to the house and aggravating a different problem. Mm. Um, but either good. way, if the water's sitting there, that would explain a bit why, because you're you're almost at. Yeah, it's a bowl on top of a knoll. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so there's not huge watershed feeding into it. Something else must be going on there a little bit. Yeah. Maybe yeah. talk about these swales for a little bit. Is this even? Well, these aren't really swales. They're just like bermed up. They're on contour-ish. It looks like. It's on contour-ish, but yeah. we did straight, and we just piled up some of our extra dirt and wood chips here. You can see water's getting stuck behind. Yeah. The yeah. Stage, so. Which we don't yeah. mind. What, there's pawpaw there? There's pawpaw, and then uh, we put, planted your, uh, I think it was the currant or the chokeberry down there, because the we're, we we don't want to do too high of trees uh, closer to that uh, birdhouse, because they don't like to have trees in front oh, of their sweet. birdhouse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, this, uh, I mean, lots more planting that can happen. That's yeah, cool. we didn't get to planting. Um, it, we just got to putting it down last year mm -hmm. after the meadow. I th so it seems worth noting. I think it's really exciting and wonderful that you focus so much on like diverse native plants and then perennials, like all that's amazing. And then it's worth remembering that annuals are super legit too. And like, if you're not ready to think about what sort of complex beautiful shrub and tree mm -hmm. and long-lived perennial herbaceous layers happen like winter squash is pretty cool yeah you know like you true. can fill yeah. these spaces and yeah. have them because otherwise something else somebody else will have to fill it in and yeah. it'll probably be grasses and then it'll yeah. be a challenge later we got this done um late october last year mm -hmm. and our plan is to actually plant it this year cool this Great. area and that interstitial land area right here we're going to take down quite a bit of those Norway spruce. Okay. Because yeah. they'll get to be like that size. And then we do want to manage that back area as an agroforestry area and let in a lot of light. And then we're actually having to take out a lot of the dying ash and um, some really unhealthy trees back there. And it will actually bring in a lot of light. We're going to do like massive restoration of the forest and we just finally got the deer fence into some of the forest already so we could see maybe some regeneration because we don't have any mm -hmm. whatsoever because yep. of the deer pressure deer are hungry yeah for sure um well we could explore in there if you want we could move down towards i think we'll yeah. move down here right behind that electric box used to be another pond but they dug that one on the left instead yeah, and huh. then put that one down there eventually. Huh. So the, the water moves in a very interesting manner. It kind of zigzags through the land in a very cool manner that we wouldn't change, really. Yeah. So Yeah, the more zigzag, the better. Well, I guess so a question that I have on our way down there, this whole space, which was shaped and seeded, was this oat? Well, this was, uh, we did three cover crops, two rounds of buckwheat that were disked in, and then this was oats that winter killed. Okay. And then we um, have planted about 40% because there was a seed shortage. We tried to find, um, there was about 70 different, primarily native species aside for four that we seeded in here. But we only got about 40% of the seed, unfortunately, because of the seed shortage and we we're trying to get them as by a regional as possible. It was very challenging and some of them were really obscure <laughs> Yeah. Well, seeds. And so the idea is that this whole space for the most part will be like very diverse perennial meadow. Exactly, cool. yeah. Cool, okay, wow. And, but we could do some swales and plant some trees. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you remember the last page of the PDF that I sent, but we thought, well, we could maybe slow some of the water that comes down and put some swales on contour and then maybe plant some trees without taking the view away so we'd we'd plant them in strategic areas but mm -hmm. you don't need view this way really so it, and you'll see down here which is where we're taking you is yeah. where we have this real probably the worst water issue that we have on the land i i was joking that we should turn 
make a moat around the barn. The previous owners told us that they put this pond because it got so wet when the water was coming down. Mm -hmm. And then that water then flows under and goes into that pond. And then that pond has an outpouring into the rivulet down over there. So its outflow goes further. Yeah, well, but then... Let's, let's start from the beginning. Yeah. yeah. So it comes down this driveway on, on both sides. Yep. Yeah. And then here, where that old gate is, yeah. that's where it stops and makes a 90 degree turn. Right here. That little Oof, valley yep. behind these trees. Yep. And then it goes into this small pond. Which was dug because it was starting to collect water down here, which it still does, which will share with you. So you see how it's uh, indented there? That's where the water goes here. on the ground, goes in here, and then it leaves the pond over there, and huh. it goes to the other one. Yep. And that's where it goes on the other side of that. It goes the other field. one underground in tubes? Underground in Yeah, tubes, fun. Yeah. OK. I think another issue is the barn doesn't have gutters. So when we get snow that comes yeah. off of it, it just kind of sits there. And the water was coming down here. Sonder just did this. It's like a haphazard driveway because it's useful. But right now it has turned into like a stream and it would have mm. I don't think the driveway did anything because it was just always like kind of like this and then obviously you see it becomes an ice rink by the barn and that's obviously south facing and then you have north so it doesn't it doesn't um it just kind of sits sits there yeah and then this become Oof. has become a stream and so we we're like do we need to increase the size of the pond do we need you know that's what started to bring us you know can we swale some things up so that we have you know, trees that soak some stuff in. So what's really happening is that the water is not coming from the pond area. It is coming from this driveway here. Yeah. And then it's making its way through here, and then it's piling up right in front of the barn there. And then what it does, it makes its way to the right side of the gate, and then yeah. it goes to the ditch behind it and near the road. Right. But right now it just pulls up here in front of the barn. Yep. Yeah, it's got very little, there's pretty much no option there. Yeah. And, and some of it makes its way to the right of it. Yeah, but that's an ask to go from that low yeah. ice yeah. point to um, either pass the pine into the fence is a good foot to two feet of lift or cut. And then the same thing in this direction. So. That's where you should build your pond next to you. I, have that's, a barn why, pond. that's why I said. That's why I said. I said we should do a moat, like, right. and just have the yeah. whole thing around the yeah. barn, and it's just floating in a moat. Find some northern hardy alligators, and that, yeah. there we yeah. go. I'm glad we talked. Um, <laughs> the castle bridge. So, so I think it comes to the same. So the, the same like pathway of questions is like, uh, you know, is this about aesthetics or is this about reality? It's like truly, this is about the reality, the other one mm -hmm. is too, but this one's like, okay, you have a situation that is pretty erosive to the health of that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. There's probably ice issues on the road. You know, like there's lots of layers of reason why refining and intervening makes sense. Uh, so then it's, okay, where is the water coming into the system? And that we should look probably for a bit at the road itself, like probably either some sort of water bar or a series of gentle water bars that ask the flow that's on the road surface itself a little bit more assertively, like, yo, come over mm -hmm. here and get to that weird little ditch. Mm -hmm. um, because yeah, that's a lot coming in. Um, so should we look at that yeah. first? Yeah, Let's spend sure. just a few minutes. Uh, is that a term you're familiar with? The water bar? No. Um, hopefully I'm using the right term. That's a that's, that's a, more ditch. Like a ditch. Yeah, and that's that's nice. That's doing some work. But this is what I'm looking at. This yeah. is clearly yeah. So this is actually not. It might not be too big a deal. So you see the see it's coming down the yeah the road now. So you get to see where right. it goes. And this is some work you can chip so, away at. So it may be just around this gate where we start to direct it here. Yep. Like right here. Yeah. Instead of using brute force yeah. to like force an opponent, it's like uh, taking the energy of that's coming in and redirecting it mm -hmm. with a little bit of assertiveness, but nothing to, and if need be, repeating the action to, to get it to go 
anyway, without using a weird analogy, yeah. it's straightforward. You've got water that's coming through this channel. Yeah. Really, really clearly, this is aggravating that problem down there. Right. And then also is aggravating, ultimately, you get like two inches of rain out of nowhere and you'll start losing this road really easily. Yeah. So we have. what you can do is, and again, this is shovel work, so it's really um, straightforward. Rather than a single monolithic aggressive you know, dig in and make this, this rut to make sure every drop of water gets in over here. You do it a few times over and over again, where literally you would take a shovel. We could grab shovels and actually just do this mm -hmm. if you want, and you could see the effect. Mm -hmm. But we would take the shovel and shave a shovel's width mm -hmm. just down, let's say, two inches. And all of this material so basically you would cut two inches down, shave, mm -hmm. until we're into the grass, mm -hmm. until we're actually into this lull. Yeah. So the water's now here. The, all of the cut that comes from that work is gently deposited in the recess. Mm -hmm. And we're doing it in a subtle enough way that when you're driving on this, you'd feel it in the tires but it wouldn't be like ba-boom, ba-boom, yeah. ba-boom. It would just be a little bit. You would do it once, you would come up the line, do it again. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's every, you could start with every 30 feet mm -hmm. and see what that does. And then split it to every 15 it's feet. It's almost like speed bumps, but water bumps instead. Yep, yeah. the water bar. Yeah. And it's, it's about, you know, rather than like, massive crater, huge tube, mm -hmm. let's rent a machine, mm -hmm. it's, a half hour of shovel work mm -hmm. and each place where you're seeing it happen the more you do it upslope the less you'd have to deal with it downslope but you could start at any place in the, the landscape you'd get the highest leverage if you started with one or two right up yeah. where that little roadway exactly. is exactly it kind of looks like where it starts the most around where the roadway is mm -hmm. and it would be about so where you've got the gravel that's where you're laying it back in mm -hmm. to the system when you get into your sod or your vegetative layer then you're making sure that stays in this layer yeah right so you're not bringing soil and sod into the driveway and vice versa from you know you get the idea yeah but and it can be really subtle so long as you see the water slowing there and coming here fully enough that it rests, mm -hmm. it's soundly coming into this track, mm -hmm. you're done with that one. Yeah. You can always come back and deepen it or adjust, refine it, and just repeat it. Because, yeah, that would actually, I mean, you've got this entire watershed missing the intended drainage yeah. spot. I think maybe it had been like that at some point because I noticed that there was a lot of wet loving plants here yep. that we pulled out and re-replanted around the pond. Yep. And so I think at one point this was kind of like the alluvial, you know, runoff basically. Yeah. And it's, you know, almost certainly it's like you think about plowing, that's going to erase that work. Yes. So it's something you'd have to repeat again. Yeah. And, you know, maybe down the road there's a bigger lift and you the whole... Because, you know, you're not too many years out from thinking about the road being looked at in a more thorough way. Right. But rather than, like, thousands and thousands of dollars of redoing it from scratch, just fix it now in a half hour so that at least until next winter you've got a solution that is... Fully, fully within your realm of adjusting, mm -hmm. and then you can decide. Yes, we do need a better road system. We need to redo drainage with machines. You might not need to get down there. Uh, I think if you did a little bit more further up before that road, mm -hmm. because the road was cut in a way like that, would actually help a bit more water start to send down that way. Yeah. I think the swales idea, which we can look at and explore, would be impactful and positive in the total as far as like helping with watershed health yeah. and giving opportunity for trees and, and recharging aquifers, it probably would not have significant influence on what's happening with this and that barn. Right. Um, but they're all worth doing, I yeah. think. So here you can see that there's a lot of water coming down from the driveway on this side. Mm -hmm. And then it's just kind of puddling up here. And there used to be a tree here but what we're thinking of doing is just continuing this, take this stump out, and just continuing this trench down to the on the left side of the road here. Um, well, yeah. 
Well, if it- This just floods here. What I'd put for, um, there's a lot of lifting or a lot of diesel to get the stump out. Okay. I don't think you'd need this stump out to have positive effect. You could just go next to it, you think? Yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, I think you, so, you know, you've got your lull here and then there's diffuse water happening. You can decide. So naturally it's kind of splitting because of machine track stuff and then reconvening. Um, I think you could pretty easily ask the water. Um, you could decide. It probably would be a little bit safer for the road health to go a little further over if it's a split decision. And I would take this section. And so a question like, is this this meant to be Hugel mounds in the future? Yeah, exactly. That's just there to stay. Okay. So then you could be everything you're digging by hand from here can be flipped upside down to add a soil layer to your hugel mound. So you're, you're managing and harvesting a valuable product that's proximal. And so you would dig through here, and this you can, again, we could do today, definitely after the next uh, thaw. But I, I would be cutting, so if it were me, I would cut something out, you know, again, not two feet deep, but maybe just a foot deep or so taking all of this really valuable material and getting it up and on that bed. And then when you get to right around here, there's an opportunity to actually dig a little bit more significantly. And again, all onto there. So it's completely a cut and fill and have this act as a silt trap. And then, so in other words, like maybe it's a six foot diameter, maybe it goes down a full foot nothing crazy, but it's a nice vernal pool. Maybe it's wider if that's what you want. Maybe there's a second one near it. There's lots of opportunity for that. And then you can decide once you've cut that out, where do you want it to flow from there? And seems like it's not unreasonable to ask it to kind of consolidate a little. So now we're back to shaving and sending over to the beds and get it just to the other side. Once it's over here, is it an issue? No, there it doesn't matter. So then I think that would get you. So instead of sending it to the right of that, you would say you could even just send it to the left. I would personally prefer to send it a little more this way for a few reasons. It One, that whole area, right? it adds more moisture to the underside of a woody, uh, a woody perennial system that you can set. Like it basically waters the Hugel Mound from below. Yeah. So it sends it to somewhere that would. Uh, find value in it. And it keeps it a little further away from the watershed management that is the side of the road that is fragile inherently anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's like the more we can suggest that the water leaves the road surface and actually goes further is generally better for uh, yeah. the overall picture. So yeah, we have the option to send it right there and then it will feed that Google mound there from the back and then it slowly seeps through that to the road, but then it doesn't just drain out immediately. Yep. Right. right. And if there's like a powerful rain or a really fast thaw out of nowhere, there'd be lots of water in here for a week or two weeks. Who cares? Yeah. Right. It's not hurting the building. It's not in the way of the road. It can take its time. And again, it comes back to that spirit of like the slow it, spread it and sink it vibe which is what we want for all this stuff. Yeah. Um, and then, then there's an opportunity to observe and interact. So like you dig out a little pond and you notice salamanders or frogs or you see creatures and then you see, okay, it actually dries up faster than we like. Maybe you widen and deepen it. But this is already beginning the work of acting as a silt trap. So this is this winter's soil losses from upslope, right? And so seeing that, and the reason for that is it's, it's accelerating in and then it kind of hits an inflection point. It loses its energy. So the, so the material in suspension gets dropped out. And so we can just excel, we can intensify that by like making it a larger silt trap. Right, and so this is what's lo like, this is the silt here flowing. Yeah, this is free. it's taking out all the soil. And if you do a little pond here, that means that you're trapping the soil on the land and only the water will leave. Yep, you're leaving a lot more time for, for the, the water when it's in a turbulent state to relax and drop, drop what it's carrying, drop its load. Right. 
in the landscape. And each time you do, each one of those you do has a positive influence. So rather than like one huge silt trap right here, you could say, let's do a little bubble and another bubble that are six inches and six inches. And that's where we're getting most of our silt from. And then there'll be a little in here but so it's like each time you repeat it, you get more positive effect. It could and you, be almost like pits and mounds in a way. Like, yeah. you know, how you see them in the forest and where the little froggies come in and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's the game. If there's like an overarching, simplif like oversimplified way or lens that I look through, it's like, how do we return the most physical complexity to a landscape before we die? Mm. Like the most three-dimensionality as possible yeah. um, has the most positive inf impact for the most general things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like the most wild productive spaces. Everything gets smoothed out with machine work, but then like ultimately it'll go back to being complex and lumpy. Yeah. So if we can do that, especially where water is involved, it just has a lot more dynamism and microclimate and a lot more like overall resilience. Um, but yeah, every scoop, just think the Hugo Mounds need so much more soil on top before they can be um, productive. So the more you harvest, from every, it's worth each shovelful going a, like a few steps, I think. Yeah, you could cut. Okay, yeah, being down here now, I see it's, it's less of a lift than from up above, it looked like it was more. Yeah. You'd have a hard time with this tree, but you could dig on this side of it. That, this is just like another one of those, you know, as soon as there's a thaw, um, am I seeing pack? Yeah. So water, <clears throat> the last time there was an, in, was this, uh, there was that like almost inch of rain last week that happened through here, right? You had the thaw and then it rained a whole bunch. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. so <clears throat> this tells me a lot. You see what's going on here? This was how the water flowed. Uh, so this took on a massive amount of water, enough to lift a whole bunch of chips from upslope. And yeah, you see, you can see the packing pattern, right? So the, the grass is pushed over. So this means probably water was about, <clears throat> excuse me, this high and rushing very fast down through here. It's a good reminder how herbaceous plants do good work in reducing erosion. So in this case, your soil particle was wood chip. So it was strong enough water flow to lift wood chips. And the grass was what acted as that sieve to hold it back in here. But uh, depending on how much water, so in an ideal world, we don't dig a lot through here. We address it up slope, but you could also concurrently come to here and say, clearly this is where the water is wanting to flow through. And just help it along there. Yep, again, We'll, we'll look at it, but it's not about stepping on the shovel and going yeah, it's full. Very gentle, yeah. It's a shave. And in fact, a lot of it is like taking these kinds of shovels and taking a file, like the one in your right hand is the kind of like the default tool I use for all this work. Um, so you just kind of gently shave it. Now, do you win it like as it rains so you can see your work or? You don't have to do it while it's actively raining because that's and that's fun when it's like 80 degrees and it's a summer. <laughs> this time of year, you can wait till it's done raining for sure. Or you can wait till, I mean, you're gonna have probably like Monday through Thursday of next week will all be days that would be very appropriate for doing this kind of work. Um, and you could take a flat file and shave on the inside here, like almost flat to the shovel, the leading, set, like the center half or third if that's, it doesn't have to be like a razor blade, but if it's flattened out here and shaved, when you get into sod layer uh, soil, it just gets under it a lot smoother. It's just a lot easier to work with. But this might be too frozen, <clears throat> but you can see like, yeah, see that's like, if it was sharper, it would cut that a little bit. And this, I can share the cheesy ergonomics. Like if you do enough of this, it really matters. If you lift like this, you're using your arms and your back. And so I use my leg in front and I shave, and then I use this as my fulcrum and I can just do that. So my back hasn't moved at all. And it lets me like slice and pry and then flip that over. 
And so you can kind of just get, and this is a way to also acknowledge this tree and not necessarily be slamming on the roots. Like if you hit a root, you can ask, can I go a different pathway here? And so, so you pry a little and you go from there, right? And that might be as far as you need to take it. I think that will help a lot with channeling that water into the right direction. And then, but then we want to ask, we want to say again, like, okay, yes, we're getting this water to move along. That's all well and good. But where do we say, hey, we don't want to lose all the soil or all the wood chips. So maybe it's comes around this corner and we're on our way now to getting down the slope. What do we do here? Maybe now we transition to a little bit of a cut and we say, you know, we want the water to keep moving, but we're going to do a little micro silt trap right here. So how big would you go? What's the smallest size you would go with that? Right that. That's the smallest size. And then so the water will continue what direction? I guess you could then... It's probably going to come through here. Yeah. Or it's going to come... Yeah, it's going to come through here. But remember, our intention with this is to get the water to move away from infrastructure or pathways that we need, but not to say to it, get out of here as fast as possible. It's just keep moving. Because you'll take all the soil of the land with it. Yep. If you rush it out. Yep. All the annual crop farming around us plays the game of the hyper aggressive, all of you drops of water, get out of here as yeah, fast as possible. Heavy tile drainage. Right. Yeah. And that's why we see every waterway look like thick chocolate milk after a quarter inch of rain. Yeah. Like small rain events are destructive now. Yeah. And Cayuga Lake is just like filling with silt, right? Yeah. Cause like there are no silt traps cause everything is about like, get it out of here, get it out of here. So we're saying, hey, come on, you can keep moving and drop your briefcase, drop your packages here. Okay, you can keep moving. And I wouldn't personally, I wouldn't cut anymore now. I'd see what this looks like after it thaws a bit just come down with a shovel. Yeah. It's maybe it's like three minutes or 10 minutes on a given issue uh, at a time. And then you, ob so observe and interact. Each iteration of that is a benefit. So I, I personally wouldn't take that further. Yeah, let's see what it does. Yep. It'll be better. We can observe it after the, the big melt on, after Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Saturday night, it's like eight inches of snow. Then it'll be 15 degrees, yeah. then spring, question yeah. mark, yeah. maybe. Um, but there's no rush. It's like you're setting in this infrastructure. And then the nice layer is, you know, okay, it's starting to function. We like the feel. Maybe we don't need to take it any further. What does it look like now that we've deposited richer soil right here? Maybe this is where we throw a little bit of nice perennial seed. Mm -hmm. Maybe we have a current cutting left over. We'll stick that in. And you start associating plantings next to the waterway so that each time in the future when you harvest a nice shovel full of silt that dropped into here, you can put it as a mulch or as a feed for a plant that's nearby. Mm -hmm. And then you're creating little ecosystems around mm -hmm. it. Um, and as long as you have this, you're good for a lifetime in managing it. Should we finish that driveway section? Yeah, Just let's to do that. wrap up how, uh, how that works? Sure. Yeah. So there's a lot happening here. Like this is again, so this is getting into the realm of like pretty tough what happened in this spot. Like clearly that rain was really aggressive moving through here. So yeah, you really want to finish your trench before it rains. And it cut, like it eroded a fair bit of that bank too. Yep. Um, so what I would try to do is avoid having an ideal scenario, and especially with the realities of this scene, I would avoid cutting through this road because it feels fragile already and say, again, how do we 
And I think I saw some spots where we could ask the water to not come through here in the first place, but all right, whatever water did get through here, can it be a game of, does, is this planted? No. no. Okay, so, you know, upslope, maybe it follows the contour of the road, is we say like, all right, let's shave a little and deposit it downslope. Hopefully I'm not, I'm not in the actual road. There's no, right? there's no real. This, this road has not been defined yet. Really. It's not real, it's not a real road. So it was it just a hill out. before. It kind of starts here on this bank. Yeah. This tree, so. But yeah, we get your gist of like, just gently. Yeah, she would send it that way. Slurfing it through here. We see it, it's already. Yeah, keep going. This <laughs> water is now going this way. Right. And so you can come at it from either side now and you can say, it's when you actively see the flow that you can make these changes. If a channel is quite shallow, will it also act as a sill trap? Yeah, yep. Especially when you make turns when there's turns, that really has a huge influence, right? So now we're seeing that the water does come this way, some of it. I know not all of it because clearly there's water coming this way mm -hmm. from this same little micro space. So we can say, well, let's grab a little more of that upland watershed. This is another one where you can use your body, like you can put the tool into your hip and your body moving forward is what makes the cut. It's really weird looking, mm -hmm. the way I'm doing this, right? But if you notice my lower back is not, I'm not doing the work with my lower back and that's the weakest part of my body. What's that Olympic sport uh, where you're on ice and you push the- Curling. Curling, it looks like go. curling. Yep. <laughs> Imagine if they had Olympic sports for like tree planting, and ditch digging, like <laughs> they, soil healing. Isn't that like the lumberman like <laughs> challenge though? It feels a little bit like that. <laughs> um, so that's that's starting. You know, now we've got something that's like a catch, and then because there's so much wood chip, it's very porous, which is fine. Like a lot's leaking through right here. So then we would need to figure out. You know, now I'm seeing from up, up watershed, it's entering into here, mm -hmm. it is coming this way. We just need to see that it's aiming in the direction. Mm -hmm. Not that it's rushing in the direction, but that it's going, right? And then as soon as it's going, you're done. You go to the next spot. And we might find that you have to like, go a little bit deeper in some spots because the elevation is actually increasing. But here, if I scrape it, yep, it's doing the right thing. So I can go to the next spot. You can see we have all that good clay here. It is a clayy time. Yeah. But that combo of mineral rich clay with strata of wood chips, that's a ridiculous planting bed. Mm -hmm. Maybe not this spring, but in the fall. Mm -hmm. But certainly you can throw some cover crop or like, you know. Yeah, it would be quite nice to have a bit of a berm on the side of the road where you could plant some stuff in and that defines kind of where the road is. Mm -hmm. line, you know? yep. And it would take care of all the water issues that will ever come down that road. Yep. And it can be, and you know, it could be like kale and watermelon radish and spinach and that kind of stuff for now. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, zinnias and like, you know, calendula and flowers. And then in the fall, it can be, maybe there's some woody shrubs maybe that's a little too much for such a small roadway. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, cool, more lobelia and elecampane and like right. water appreciating herbaceous. Well, I like that because also the road won't be so like, ooh, this is a road, you know what I yeah. mean? It's, it's a much more gentle glide from like habitat to an access point. Mm -hmm. Right, it's a space for birds and creatures to also want to hang out Yeah. as they're moving through. Um, so yeah, and you know, you can see here's where a lot of water, so this is definitely a spot. And uh, you know, I wouldn't take any material from the road to do this because right. we want that to stay as ridged as possible. If yeah. anything, you take a little more from up top to make your berm. Um, 
but chances are if we do some other work, we'll see some relatively still pooling here and then the problem will continue on because until we cut that pool, we don't know. So if the rate of flow is very slow and the feedback, you're not, you're not getting fast enough feedback, a trick is to work, plan to do three spots in a day where you do a bit in one area and then you go somewhere else, work on that other bit so that water can aggregate so as you make cuts, you get more information. It's mm -hmm. like you're refilling the water level, so to speak, so you can see it faster. Yeah. Um, but already I can see clearly water is coming back into this. Mm -hmm. So we cut more. But just try to avoid the temptation of this kind of move. Right. Where you're like, yeah. it's just too much. It's hard on your body. It's gonna burn you out and not feel good. <laughs> and it makes for like a much harder to manage scenario. So now it's getting a little more sluggish mm -hmm. in coming this way. So it'll have to go a little lower. We don't have to spend, you know, if you feel like you got it and really it's just like five minutes and yeah. you got it. I think I yeah. keep doing this. It's fun, you're gonna love it. Mm -hmm. And then when that thaw happens, so this is, this is when you're in the realm of devastation. The scale of it right now is not bad, but imagine if we were actually looking at drone footage of yeah. like a 50 acre space yeah. here. That's what we see all the time. And that's water being too aggressive. And there's your fertility and also all this fragility that's happened here. So like yeah. once that's resolved, the next step is to swale this berm mm -hmm. if you don't need to have physical access all the time and no. plant it out. Yeah, we don't need that. We, we could plant this easily. So Shield could, it. So you would put a couple swales here. How many you think? Two. Two, yeah. Or three, um, you know. It's a little wider here, so it's could like... probably run a channel here that goes that way so that it doesn't just fall into that direction. Whatever water happens to come from here could be sent straight down there. Like, it could, in a way, this is also a berm that could have some swales. Yep, you could have a berm, yeah, swale in there. You could, so you're out of, you know, there's like multiple water, you know, they're micro watersheds, but it's all watersheds. I mean, like in your hand with a lump of soil, there's water, right? It's mm -hmm. like, it's just all scaled. Um, you could say, all right, let's have water go around here and follow along. But since we're already dealing with like a challenging scene down in here, if you could get a, sw so there's a swale as a concept is, you know, absolutely perfectly on contour. Every drop of water is equally distributed along it. Mm -hmm that doesn't help us in these scenarios because we're not just trying to deal with excess, we're dealing with excess water. We're not dealing with like farming in the hills of Arizona. It's like we need to have excess. So a swale in this landscape needs to always be pitched the tiniest bit in the direction of not the if, but when it is overflowing, where does it overflow? And so you could think of a swale that comes down along here that is still chasing water out to daylight mm -hmm. on that end, mm -hmm. if that's reasonable. And this might be a laser level or an A-frame game because you've got the infrastructure here and you want to get it right. Mm -hmm. But like, I could imagine that a trench or a cut, just like we were doing on the other side there, on this side of the driveway where each slice is deposited down slope, mm -hmm. would trend towards shedding water to that side. And in an ideal world, water on that side is better than water in the shaded lull yeah. of this side of the structure. So maybe it is a swale here, but more ditch, like mm -hmm. 2% or 4% grade. Like it's aiming to that cut we started down mm -hmm. there. And here it's a little more gentle. It's about equalizing the water, but still saying like, yep, you gotta go that way when you're full. Mm -hmm. You know, this is almost a swale-ish. Right. But, but in the spirit of a ditch, but not a ditch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a ditch. Yeah. You know, like, okay. It's, I, that, you know, I've, I've like overly used that word ask with all this, but I think it's an appropriate language lens to apply. Like you're asking, it, it will oblige, but you're not telling. It's like, 
come on, and mm -hmm. then it'll go that way. Um, but yeah, anyway. Yeah, and so now like there's there's the dam, yeah. and that needs more work, but we'll just yeah. leave that. Cool. I like how incremental of approaches they are. They're not like, you know, like you said, they're not forcing it into something, but you could just incrementally look at how it reacts, and then if you want to come out the next day later and do a little bit more work, if it needs it, you could do that. Yep. Like yep. Okay. Yeah, and then when it feels like it's really stable and doing its thing, then you can start really adding the plant layer. And then you can still dig and just use that as mulch and fertility for the plant layer. You're giving me more reasons to plant, Sean. Yeah, always. <laughs> to dig more and plants. plant. <laughs> but Thank then, you, Sean. That's great. But I think that's the, the key to all this is it really all of this lives in human scale tools you already have and measurement systems you have inside your body already. Mm -hmm. Then it's like it feels like it could actually be accessible and it's applicable at any scale too. I mean, clearly 100 acres, no, but you know, within reason and even like an hour of shovel work up here or half hour may have huge effect on hydrology in like three acres down slope down the road, right? Like a little bit goes a long way. Um, should we do the road? Yeah, let's yeah. finish with the road. Yeah. It starts further up there, right? Sure. You can go wherever. I mean, uh, I mean, we're here, so you could start right here. Might as well start here. So I'm gonna use my hip to dig. It's weird ergonomics for sure. Whoop. And then I put it so in here. Exactly, yeah. yeah, because we're trying to encourage it to change its ways. And that might be, that's as deep as I would go. Yeah, and there But I goes. would continue it, but you now have, so there's more water, but that might be mainly, that's something we acknowledge, but we come back to in a few. That might be just what was here working itself out. Yeah. So like you don't want to, you're not going to expect that to turn off instantly. It's not a valve. True, but you could see it already it wants to go that way. It's coming way this way, and it's also telling you where it would go without cutting. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's like two or three minutes of digging that might... Over Thousands the, of dollars of road repair. Avoided. Yeah, well, and, you know, over the next week may change where 20,000 gallons of water flows. And, you know, you're aware of that this is going to be modified by snow clouds and that kind of thing. But if you have enough of them, they'll do their work. Yeah. And then you can decide like, okay, this is something that we've like fixed enough with the shovel work that we're cool with it, just as our, our yearly work, or it really more thoroughly informs how you hire machine work to do the next iteration of the road. Yeah, because I'm almost like, I'm learning what the water wants to do and where it wants to go. Mm -hmm. So even if we do this for a year or two, after that, we might want to repair this road properly. I know exactly where to focus on, where the water wants to really sit, yep. so. Where the problem spots are yeah. and how to like, inf yeah, right. This, this is really, really useful to bigger picture stuff. So that material, I would put the rest of that in this Over side here, now, because right. now you're in like a wet. different type of material. And then it might be, you know, maybe it's something where like you come out with a matic, you know, yeah, for break certain it up a little bit. tight spots, yeah. But that's that's good enough. That would be what I would call an absolutely good enough water bar for there, and then you would just repeat that again at some interval. Yeah, well, get close on it so you see the water. I think my cord is hanging. Oh. Are there other? Because it sounds like I don't. I don't have my phone on me anyway. But like, are there other areas that felt pretty important to those touch were, on? Those were the two areas. 
things that were our biggest um, issues, the other question we had is whether we were kind of debating whether we should increase the size of this pond at all. No. No? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't for now. At you, of course, I mean, I, I don't know, of course you can, but um, you've got a lot of ponds <laughs> and a lot of projects and it seems like doing scale adjustments and earthworks and getting more trees in and getting seeds established, like all of that um, feels all first really high priority. And then you can, because large stroke infrastructure like that, you had a near historic drought in 2020 mm -hmm. and then an incredibly wet year in 2021. What is 2020? We don't know. And so until you have like a three year average or a five year average, it seems like making decisions about huge landscape changes would be, there's really no way you could be well enough informed to know exactly what the right move is. So it'd be one thing if you had no water or you had no water holding, but you've got like a massive amount of water up there. All of your irrigation for anything you'd ever want to do could be with like two solar panels and a little pump and then the rest is gravity. Uh, and you've got nice habitat that's happening around that pond, so don't. <laughs> or, or maybe it's, you know, not like don't, but um, there's certainly no pressure to make it more complex or bigger than it is right now. And that's a sweet size. It's a good habitat size. And like, maybe it fills in quite a bit. It's more boggy and marshy. That would be already, and it, we get more salamanders and frogs in that one. Yeah. So that, they, hey, they, they might be really sad if you change that. Look how the water's moving in now. Mm-hmm. See where it wants to go? Here it goes, here it goes. It's direct feedback. I'm trying to get it into that ditch over there. Yeah. Because then it avoids going down yeah. where Sean was digging yeah. earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then it's like crusty, icy enough that it's tough to dig. So then don't, yeah. <laughs> you know, just make a mental map to come back to that. That's the one little bop right here. Yep. There's a little speed bump, but you know, it's close enough now. Yeah, the road's really hard there. That so I wouldn't stress Maddox about material. it, that's just frozen. So, you know, but look, you, it's already going. It's already having influence. Bro. And I see already up there. Yeah, look at that. Way right less now. water coming down here. You see the reflections get lower to the ground a little bit. I mean, even just two would have a pretty darn significant influence. Yeah. Um, I do see a fair bit coming through. You know, it's like yeah, when I it thaws to... a little more. I chase it out. A bit more of a dam over here. But that's the thing, when you've got the basic infrastructure, you might find after the snow plow comes through and then things thaw, that maybe there's a little pile here and there that like, okay, you get a shovel, but you might also find like... Just doing that. And it's fixed. Like, and you yeah. do that at each of your things <laughs> and it does it. So then you don't have to necessarily bust out the tools every single time in the future when you've got the infrastructure laid in. You know, here I can see... It's escaping there, It's huh? escaping because of this impoundment is... here, and then again here. But just so long as you have the lens in your eyes now to see that, you can just always know how to make the adjustments. Yeah. I think this is one of those things that actually lives profoundly in the realm of uh, not overthinking. Like, yeah. Everything you ever need to know about how water moves is revealed to you when water moves, right? It's like exactly. it's all it's there instant on the surface. feedback. Yep. And so then you don't you just feel it and you like you're asking yourself what you're hoping to see happen. And then as you dig, you say, 
that's moving me towards what I'm hoping to see happen or that is definitely not. It's yeah. Just make adjustments. So then a couple key concepts are, we want to make sure that water doesn't rush off the land because it takes all the soil with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, a prime example was when I dug that trench here and it had one of the heaviest rains and it, the, like chocolate milk, it ran down into the ditch and it took all the soil with it. Mm -hmm. So if you can have the water be very gentle and make as much S-curves as possible through your land, mm -hmm. that's better. And then plants along the way can pick it up. You are mentioning putting in little pools so that most of that soil can kind of settle. And then, uh, yeah, that should do it. That's it. We'll continually observe how water moves in the landscape, particularly as the seasons shift and more layers of vegetation come in. This will only come in time, so we'll need to be patient. In the meantime, there's more work to be done. Now, if you like videos like this, give it a thumbs up. And if you care to help the channel, then consider subscribing and hitting the notifications button. We're reinvesting 10% of our Google AdSense proceeds back into this area. And this will be matched by our partners at Espoma Organic, which gives us more of an opportunity to make a direct impact in our community. Thank you again for considering, and we'll see you in the next episode.